Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode around the fire on Spirit Reflections. My name is Fred. And if you're here for the first time, Spirit Reflections is an ongoing series of bilingual conversations in English and Portuguese about people's personal and spiritual journeys, the tools that they found along the way, and how those tools shaped who they are and the work that they do today. We interview artists, philosophers, scientists, and relig religious people of all traditions to learn a little bit more about them and in the process discover things about ourselves. So if, if you're here for the first time, please like and subscribe on YouTube and follow us on Spotify. And you'll see that there's a lotus flower on YouTube. If you're looking for spirit reflections and you do a search, you'll see a lotus flower. That's us. And if you'd like to suggest a guest or a topic that you'd like for us to examine here around the fire, all you have to do is send an email to info at spiritreflections.org and suggest your guest. So let's talk about tonight's guest. We're going to be talking about Zen art, Zen practice and art practice, how those two can fuse. And her, we, I had the pleasure of meeting her at a constellation group, which we're going to talk about that soon. But let's read her bio so that we can register here for posterity. Hojin, Jody Hojin Kimmel Sensei, she received her priestly transmission, the transmission of the precepts from Daido Roshi, who began the process in 2009, and from Shugen Roshi, who completed the transmission in 2012. In 2017, She received the full Dharma transmission from Shugen Roshi, and I hope I'm pronouncing these correctly. And she serves as the training director for the Mountains and Rivers Order and abbot of the Zen Center of New York City, Fire Lotus Temple. Hojin Sensei began her artistic career early and has taught drawing, ceramics, and painting opening people up to the wonders and mysteries of the creative process. And she continues to offer art practices as part of her teaching. She has been in full-time residential training at the monastery since 1990. And now she shares her time at the Brooklyn Temple, which is where she's speaking from tonight. Hojin, welcome to Spirit Reflections. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, Fred. Thank you for having me around the fire. <laughs> I love that the word hearth has heart, earth, um, art, heal, all these beautiful words That's in it. That's right. Never yes. thought about that. Awesome. Yes. Hearth, wow. earth, art, health. Yeah. Yeah. We, we had the pleasure of meeting each other on a three-month journey on the science, myth, magic, and mystery classes than, that Dan Cohen and Emily Bledfield host online around family constellations, right? That's right. <laughs> It was an awesome experience. I just want to give them a shout out here for those that have, are interested in doing systemic and family constellations or would like to know more. Take a look at the website, seeingwithyourheart.com, so you can discover the work of Emily and Dan. They are one of the leaders in the world when it comes to family constellations, intuitive work, mediumistic healing, and all kinds of um alternative holistic therapies that integrate with science and it's been a three-month journey that we did with a group of about 15 people and Hojin was there and every week we would gather and do a two and a half hour session which was very alchemical and transformative to say the least and in the process we, we, we really bonded with some people and one of them for me I had a, a big impression uh, of Hojin and I said I'd love to invite her here to spirit reflection so that she can speak about art practice and Zen as two pathways for the soul. So just thought I'd give that shout out to our, our friends who introduced us. <laughs> Very much. Yeah, that's great. That was, um, that was a real nice opening kind of class and I appreciate it. And it's still, um, it grows on you. So if you do participate, it, it's, It just doesn't end with with the course, which yeah. is which is really um, For sure. nourishing. For sure. And stay tuned if you are interested in that. We are hosting one here on Spirit Reflections, a full day family constellation mm -hmm. workshop with us with astrology readings. 
on January 21st of 2023. So stay tuned for more details. All right, we've gotten those things out of the way. <laughs> Let's delve into the heart and soul of Hojin. And we always like to start here, Hojin, trying to understand a little bit of the person's a personal journey, which mm. led to their spirituality. So why don't you take us back to where it all started? Back to where it all started. Okay. Well, I'd like to just give a shout out and a welcome to all your listeners. Um, even though I can't see you, um, I'm glad you're with us this evening. Well, somebody once asked me, um, what was my first conscious experience? What was your first conscious experience? And what came into my mind was um, sand. And it was more the sensation of being on, on the beach and sand. Uh, when I was very young, we used to have a summer home in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And we would spend most of our days on the beach. And there was something about that material, that substance that was so warming and sensual. I felt so um, just at home in that material. And it was, I remember I couldn't even walk yet. Like I remember having trouble walking in it. Um, and, and then I remember the water and the feeling of water on my body. And we would sit right by the waves and, you know, I don't know if this was all when I was, you know, just before I could walk, but I remember how you stand in the ocean and when the waves would retreat, it would feel like you were going really fast on some kind of ride and you were in the same place. So I don't know, there was this wonder about, I hadn't gone anywhere, but I felt like I was moving swiftly. So there was this stillness within this motion that, um, that uh, perked up something in my senses. And then my mom would drip sand on me. She would just, and we, I would do it to myself. Um, I appreciated that my mother um, was always encouraging that I get dirty. Nice. <laughs> she wasn't, so she would say, go play in the mud. And she meant it. Um, Beautiful. And she would do it with me and we would face paint. And so it was a very tactile experience. So, so that came very early. And um, I remember um, being in my room when I was young and, you know, you would be sent to bed, um, turn the lights out, you know, and most kids had a flashlight and they would read. Well, I would take a pencil and I would draw I would just draw like out of darkness, um, whatever I could see, whatever light was available, whether it was the moon or something from under the door, there would be just pieces of shapes um, that you would have to, that I would have to complete with my own imagination. So I'd see part of a bedpost or, Sometimes you couldn't even name it. It was just a dark shape, but there was some light that, and I remember just using my pencil to draw the darkness and the pieces of light. And that became very important in my work in creating vessels because, you know, when you make a pot, it's really you're shaping the emptiness and the outside, you're drawing a line around the empty space. And, um, and so that's what I learned from in the, in working with clay, my teacher used to say, don't worry about the outside, just stretch that inside. And right. um, that was about living <laughs> and life that she was showing me. Um, so, so that was happening very um, much through my life. I, I, I even still have those stacks of early drawing, some of them, my closet, whatever. I also drew with the lights on as well. So it didn't stop. But um, so that it became evident to me that I, I like to, um, uh, I was very visual, very tactile. 
and materials used to, um, you know, I could spend a long time looking at um, anything, a rock. Um, uh, we used to get, I know this may sound weird, but we used to eat tongue. <laughs> My mother used to buy it. And I would just like study that thing and draw that for hours. Wow. Um, and then when I was about seven or eight, we went on a field trip and a potter came out and took a lump of clay and threw it on a wheel. And I'm about seven or eight with the class. And then the wheel started to spin and this vessel, just with his hands, this vessel began to grow out of this lump. And wow. something viscerally hit me so deep in very low in my body. And I got this clear message. You are going to do that. You are wow. going to do that. And I went home and I told my mother that what I saw and this pot that formed this vessel and she responded and she put me in a class right away to start working in clay. So just so I understand this memory that was very striking for you in your childhood, what you saw was through some, some kind of a clairvoyance, like your imagination, or the pot actually became a vessel physically? No, the pot became a vessel physically. Oh. But viscerally, my body felt that I was going to, that I should do this. I'm doing, I'm going to be doing this. I want to do this. That's so why you, I'm. Your, your calling for art came really early and it was very certain. Yes, it was very certain. And, um, and as most of us are, like when we're children, I had quite an imagination. I was always, you know, in the woods and building forts and and making sculptures and creating, you know, these whole worlds within worlds within worlds until I would pop out time for dinner or something, you know, nice. go home. Um, but that never got discouraged. Um, so it was encouraged. Um, I come from... I had some arts in my family background, so um, so it was understood to some degree um, that that's what I was doing. And, and so uh, that, that was sort of your initiation, if you will, to the world of art from a very early age, it seems. Your spirit woke up to that talent, to that calling. Was there another aspect that you also uh, woke up to in the quote unquote, from your family's sort of religious traditions or spiritual traditions? Was there anything related to that, that you were exposed to that made you want to like examine more or? Not, not consciously because religion wasn't really a big um, um, part of my upbringing. Uh, we were very secular in that sense. Got and it. just, um, but I think the way my, you know, I think we learn how to breathe and what, what, what religion is. We learn about spirit breath mm -hmm. by what we, what clo those closest to us are doing, what they're doing with their thoughts, speech, and actions. And I think there was an appreciation of beauty, of kindness, um, you know, I'm not saying it was like the the ideal. Sure. Yes, there's the bumps and the and the warts and all that. But at the at the deepest level, there was a lot of goodness, I mm -hmm. would say. And um, uh, so that's you know when, when when I would watch my mother cook and be on her elbow, I could see I could see the way she handled a vegetable. I, I, that was transmitted to me, those gestures of appreciating the, the, the life uh, yeah. that was in front of, of her. 
And the so, so you had this meditative gaze of observing these mo rituals of cooking, for example, from an early age. Yes, yes, and there there were the were those rituals, and there was music in the house and things like that. Um, uh, so, I so you you got back home. You said I want to do this for a living. Or mom signs you up to uh, <laughs> ceramics, I mean, pot pottery classes. Well, I don't know that I wanted to do it for a living, but I knew <laughs> that I had to do it, and I didn't know anything about what we would call art. I I really didn't have a name for for you know or know that there was this whole history at that point of. Right of object making. Yes, I'd been to museums and I'd seen some things, but I couldn't put all that together. And, Got it. you know, not like kids today who can say their careers at like age four, you know? <laughs> right. So you, you in, in the process, so you last, last you left us was when you were around eight. So yeah. you start having the classes. So what unfolds yeah. from that? So within that, I started to be by myself a lot, which I, I, in to make things, I liked making with people, but it required a certain kind of silence with oneself, for me at least, to listen and re receive what, what my hands were doing and, and, and just let something was coming through in that, in that act of forming. And so I begin to really um, appreciate more and more silence, although I could be quite yakky as well, but um, yeah, just the, the silence of listening to creation and, um, and, um, if you want to call it the muse or something speaking um, uh, that I didn't, that was a mystery to me. And I think the question began to come up in making objects like what, what are things? Who, who am I? What is all this? What, what, what am I looking at? What am I seeing? Um, you know, it wasn't, um, so intellectual, um, but it was a very felt question. And I, and I began to sit actually by myself quietly. I would like to be in the elements. So I would either be at the shore or on anywhere, a field. I could always find in my room, just a space, just to be sitting quietly in, spa in space. And um, so that was nourished. Um, I, I continued to, st I hand built mostly, it was just, get, you know, just making uh, pots um, okay. with uh, pinching and, and hand building and painting and drawing. And I actually love every medium. I danced, I sang, I fiddled on instruments. So I didn't feel bound by, um, one uh, medium of art. One medium. Yeah, You're I just. So I'm sure this is not your first incarnation as an artist, right? <laughs> Doesn't feel that way. Yeah. Um, and I really became fascinated with bowls, like just, just bowls. And that became something I painted and drew. And I was very. Um, kind of like this, right? Yes, and that's great as a gold bowl. Yes. Um, and a gong. Yes. And so um, a lot of what I painted and drew was later on was around this question of what is a still life. Um, mm. And I would just, and I was very um, singular. So I would. I would stay with one thing, the study of one thing for a long time. I would let one thing, it was easier, easy to let one thing be my teacher, uh, like, like one subject. So a bowl became like the one thing that I would paint and draw and 
create over and over. And I began to later see that something as a representation of also as a, a as a human figure. Right. Yeah. But just just listening to you describe those endless hours that you spend over the course of your childhood making the pots and painting and connected to the art sounds like they were very contemplative and I guess in a way therapeutic too because you weren't just manually doing something on on a on a deadline or on a bind but it was like a a process of self-discovery because these questions as you're saying were popping up within you like who am I and you know these very big questions about life right yes yes and I, I, I felt kind of like a lone wolf too. So the, and, you know, and began to um, see that it, it was a, I got, I was also not a very, um, what can I say? I had a lot of feelings. I was, a, I had a very um, a strong emotional component. To, and so it really helped me if if you're saying in a therapeutic way to just give shape to what I was feeling yeah yeah and work and through. to process process the growing pains of uh, adolescence and oh my God years. yes <laughs> and you know I would even I was kind of shy and I didn't really fit in either so I would go to parties and I didn't like them but I didn't know what else to do, and I would draw at the party. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. I would just keep practicing that. At what point does the practice of Zen, and can I call it Zen Buddhism, or is it too? Sure. Familiar? Yes. So at what point does that path arrive at your doorstep? Yeah, okay. So um, I go to school and I didn't start as an art major. I started in environmental biology because I thought, or, and I also was interested in archaeology or anthropology because very I, tactile. I, uh, uh, yes. And looking at culture and objects that they make and, and digging them up. So it had something in that. And also yeah. I really cared deeply for this earth. You know, I used earth materials, fire, water, air, you nice. know, all the, all the components of what I was making was from the earth. Um, and I couldn't see like declaring myself an art major, like who isn't, you know, like what's there to declare for that. Right. But I realized, you know, I did take ceramics and then I was encouraged by my teachers that there was much more to this and I started to you know learn art history and and then I switched and so my my I started to just that was my religion I uh, art was my religion I I just did it all the time I and love that. and um and then one day I was at a later um i was in moved to new jersey after teaching i was in the middle of teaching i taught at community colleges um i learned how to sit um formally i ran into a, a zen teacher that came to my college and my friend asked me do i want to meet this zen master and learn to sit i said sure and he didn't remember anything about it but i continued I, so I, for those of us that are completely new at this, how do you learn how to sit? You just okay. sit. <laughs> so yes, well, you take a seat and there are noble postures that you can take on a cushion, a bench, a chair, and you um, take a few breaths to center yourself, find yourself mm -hmm. in the center of gravity. And then we were instructed to make contact with the fact that we're breathing. Got it. This vital life source. Taking an air, inhale and an exhale. And then we learned that we should count. So as you inhale at that gap, one, and then you exhale, two. And you would just go to 10. And if your mind wandered... If you got lost in a in a story or a narrative, you would just see that, just notice that, 
when you do, like a bird flying off a branch, you lose your attention, You, the bird flies, then you would just see that, you acknowledge it, and you would come back to your breath. Because that's it. where our life is taking place. It's Got always it. now. So that was a your first experience at this practice, which is really centering oneself in the present moment, being more aware of right here, right now. Of and see, body, right seeing now. what's arising and how the discriminating mind um, imputes and, and takes us away from yeah. the present moment. It's not that thoughts are bad. We need them, of course, but it just that, that, that it goes on and on and mm -hmm. on. So course, this yeah. is a way to let go and make space. Got and it. so that really felt close to exactly what I was doing on the wheel. Already, right? Already. Uh, in your art creations. I, I was, that was what I was preparing. Um, and so I went to, uh, I started to show my work. I thought, okay, that's what artists do. They're supposed to show. And I tried that route. And I was at an exhibit with a, a woman who was who had a painting next to mine and I loved her work she loved mine we befriended each other and I went to her house and we were talking and she said um uh, and I had told her I was interested in the arts from the east I love the dynamic calligraphies the the black brush mm -hmm. and and um I had seen pot My teacher was very, my first teacher was very um, formal in his pottery. There was measurements. The foot had to be a certain height and then the body, very proportioned kind of European formalistic kind of pottery. Mm -hmm. And then I, I had the great privilege of, of going to see an exhibit of Japanese pottery and I held the bowl, um, this bowl that was, Um, thrown asymmetrical very asymmetrical deeply centered right so it was uneven okay it was uneven very asymmetrical it was repaired so it had cracked and there was a gold line that was that was going through it like a river running through and it was repaired And it, it was so centered that I, I, and deep, when I looked in, it was just so deep, like fathom, unfathomable in its depth. And I started weeping. That's, wow, that's really touching. I started weeping over this bowl as I was holding it. And I could feel like the maker. And I just burst out and I said, who let this happen? So you actually felt the energy of the maker. It I, was imp it was imprinted on the bowl. I don't know what to call it, but I felt this whatever they were putting into it, whatever something, right? Yeah, the, the you know, spirit is, uh, they call that psychometry, which is a a type of psychic ability or extrasensory perception mm. that if you take somebody's object, so if this belongs to a person, mm. that I can take it and really concentrate, and I can literally read the person's moods, emotions, sensations really describe them from head to toe. So I guess that's what you experienced there, right? Something of that nature. And, you know, Alan Watts used to say that the arts of Zen are effing the ineffable. <laughs> I love <laughs> so that. So I was getting the F, you know? I was getting the, the, the effing of the ineffable. So something that's there, outraged. Who did, who let this happen to this bowl that right. cracked? Who right? let this happen? So I found out it was this, Japanese Buddhist nun from the late 1800s. Her name was Otagaki Rengetsu. Wow. And I looked her up and I thought, oh, there's something in this. Um, so I went to this woman's house. And I was working on a painting, a large painting of a, a skeleton within a very translucent giant bottle. This painting was like 
eight feet tall. And the skeleton was in this bottle. There was a bowl outside. But anyway, it was a little bit boring to me. Something was like just not <laughs> happening. And I was looking at how words, language reifies things that if there wasn't any if that sometimes language fixes things and gives them no room, we call something something and then we immediately, that's it. And we get an idea of what it is and it's sort of narrow. So yeah. at the last minute before I went to dinner at her house, I, I was working on tar paper, which is roofing paper, which is very soft and malleable like clay because it, it's black. Roofing right. paper's black. So it, there I was going back to the darkness. So I would put a light tone on this roofing paper and then gouge back into it and bring out these dark lines. And it was like clay and it had a memory. So if I took it away, that line would remain there, but it would fade out if I painted over it. Got so. It. But it was very um, textural. It wasn't like a painted line. It was dug. Right. So I went to her house and she says, you know, there's a Zen um, art center in upstate New York and they do pottery. And, and that, do you know, she said, do you know about Zen? I said, a little. I know a little about Buddhism. She said, well, the teacher there came from an art background and he sees art practice as a path of liberation. So, so it was based on the eightfold path that the Buddha mm -hmm, teaches. Mm -hmm. Right. And he, and he said, used art as a way to teach modern students how to see the nature of the self and be free. So this, she gave, Zen, so this is the Zen Mountain Monastery. Correct. So about. she gave me the, we had a journal and she hands me the journal and on, on the, so oh, on that painting, did I, I don't know if I said, I wrote words, 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 before I left the house. That's what I wrote. I just wrote in words, 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 stamped it all around. So she hands me this journal and on the cover of the journal, it says, Words, 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 wow. words, 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 in all different languages. What? What? And I said, I was like, what? And, you know, those things weren't surprising to me in life. Um, I didn't, I just, I just, that, that happened a lot. I, I was open to that. And so. Those, like synchronicities or coincidences, quote yeah. unquote, right? Yeah. I think it was something was, so I. I said, okay. And uh, <laughs> I read my teacher's discourse and uh, uh, who became my teacher. He wasn't, I didn't know about him at that point. Right. And suddenly. And, and this, and we're talking about like what, late, late 80s? Yeah, like 1989. Okay. Yeah. And I, when I read his talk, there was something, I had a conversion inside, like, I, I suddenly understood some, I had a language, a different kind of language for what I was after in my work. I didn't understand what I was seeing or, or, or it just gave me a language. You know, he, he said it, to study the Buddha way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be awakened by the 10,000 things. And that awakening continues endlessly. So there was something between separate, between me and everything else that I could feel sometimes. I said it was language. It was just this way of being separate. And that's right, that's the quote. And so I was like, what does this mean? What is it to forget the self? What self? What is the self? And so, you know, Buddha spoke of the self as a mental construct. Right. That there's no fixed entity. 
no fixed inherentness to any self inherent fixedness to anything, any phenomena in the whole universe. <laughs> it was in a constant state of flux of a con we were contingent moving beings. And the only right. thing that stops that flow is what we impute on things. And that what would be another from, word for impute? Um, we, we put on to things. Um, like what we label, perhaps? Well, or label, what? right. Label, right. And that, of course, we need that. and But we fundamentally misunderstand um, who we are. And that's... that's Because we get stuck the on the label. That's the big, big problem <laughs> that's the big thing that right. the buddha realized was um that nature and it's unique to buddhism that there is no nothing external um, there's no there's no uh association God. of sin and salvation condemnation no. right it's all right here right now we all yeah. know that you know you want to be in heaven right now? We understand that. Hell right now? We got that yep. down pretty good. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and we go so, in in and out of both within matters of seconds, right? Right. Exactly. So to sit down and see the nature of thought and, and to let go is to begin to look at that conditioning, the ways that we um, have learned the conditioning from generations, right. from our parents, teachers, um, peers, whoever, and we begin to accumulate yeah. this data about things and who we are that separate us. And when we can release that, see it for what it is, see yeah. things as they are, then the 10,000 things come forward to realize yourself rather than us right. going after everything. <laughs> right. It just blossoms from within, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's and it's the age old conditioning we've inherited from our ancestors. And when we study family constellation, we see the amount of patterns of emotional patterns that we've inherited and we are reenacting many times, most times unconsciously, and not realizing that this is there's this script that is really uh, clamping us down, right? From and, and when you really look at free will, is it really free when you examine all of these uh, conditionings that are running the, the show? That's right. Yeah. So that's the practice. The practice is revealing what has always been the Buddha nature, we call it. There's other names for it um, in other religions, but that which is has always been perfect and complete, lacking nothing, is always there. Nobody gives it to us and it can't be taken away. And it's really the emptiness within, right? It's getting to that emptiness. Right. And that's a that's a tricky word too, because right. it's it's empty of any inherent fixed nature. That's the emptiness. So then it's full can be full with the 10,000 things as the right. self. There's, there's nothing rejected and nothing possessed. Beautiful. And so take us to that moment when you're reading your teacher's discourse, something hits you, you really feel a deep conversion. And then what happens after that? Well, I or, felt, yes, yeah, so something changed, and I was like, all right, ugh, like, this can't be, like, don't mess up my life, you know, <laughs> I'm trying to get tenure, I'm on a track here, you know, I don't need this, what's this about, but I couldn't drop it, and my friend said, I'm going, you know, I told my friend, and they read it, and they're like, I'm going there, and I was like, I don't want to go, I don't want to sit with a million people, like, go, go, you have my blessings, enjoy yourself. I hope it's really great. And I'm just going to continue and sit in my room and do my thing. 
And they came back and they said, oh my God, it was amazing. It's everything we've talked about. I signed you up for an introductory retreat for your birthday. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to just go. Why not? I mean, I love yeah. this person and they've always done good by me, introducing me to um, things in my life that I never would have done. So yeah. I went and that's when the conversion came, yes. um, when I was there live. And I actually sat down with a lot of people and I heard his talk, which ha his first talk happened to be Alice in Wonderland. And I happened to collect just that very book, Alice in Wonderland, oh, wow. was a collection of books I've always had in all different sizes. She was my heroine. I always loved that she could free fall through that rabbit hole and look around at the same time without grabbing anything. I thought, <laughs> okay, that's good. That's a superpower I, I want. I want that. I want that, Alice. And that's what he talked about. And I was just like, oh my wow. God. Incredible. So, um, but I wasn't ready to become a monk and I didn't know anything about monasticism. I was just like, that was nice. And I went home and I, I couldn't sleep. I was just like, I just want to be there. I just wanted to submerge myself. I needed more. I needed to clarify. I, I think great doubt came up. I, yeah, I was just thinking, was it a moment of a dark night of the soul, if you will? In a way, yes. Because I said to my friend, you may be sorry you brought me here. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like a raccoon with in headlights, like, uh oh, what is she talking what about? What do we do? <laughs> and I was trying to, and I would wake up going like, no, because I was already like there. And I was just like, oh my God, like, how, this is a big change. Um, but it's not like I hadn't done those things, but this was like, what? Um, you know, I, everything was set up in my career blah, 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 and, and I was going to like go. I was, so I did te some testing, of course. I didn't go blindly. I, sure. I went on a wilderness retreat with the teacher and some of the monastics um, just to see, get out of the robes and the bells and just be, because nature's the great equalizer, right? Yeah, for sure. It's like... How do you deal just with like sitting on the earth and being with the trees and the darkness and, and it rained, it was a, it was a two week trip Wow! and it rained torrentially, it was 10 days, torrentially. So, so you're with, with how many people for 10 days in the wilderness? 20, 20 people. In the wilderness, we had to pack as though we were going alone. So we each had to have our own pack and our own food, our own wow. cooking stuff. And it was all by canoe. It was in, oh. in the Adirondacks. Yeah, yeah. And torrential, like nonstop. So wow. talk about bringing out your character. Yes, yeah. our characters were brought out. And he was good. He could lead and he was really, really um, um, giving us the Dharma, like really practicing the situation moment to moment, whatever. So the, the, the 10 week retreat into the wilderness didn't. No, have not 10 weeks, 10 days. Uh, sorry, 10 days. The yeah. 10 day retreat didn't have like a very fixed, rigid schedule of programs, activities and immersions. Or was was it more sort of like he was reacting to whatever was coming up? And um, he a had a plan. he had a plan. We were going to do cert a certain circuit in the Adirondacks that he had done many years ago. <clears throat> and uh, part of it was art practice. Zazen sitting. Um, he would give Dharma talks around the fire. Um, we would, you know, process the day and our encounters. So it was very much a Dharma practice retreat. 
And for those of us that don't know the word hojin, what does dharma mean? Dharma is dharma the uh -huh. dharma, dharma is the teachings of Buddhism, the teachings okay. of the Buddha. Uh, Zen is a way, um, he used to define it as a way of living your life, a way of um, using your mind, a very particular way of using your mind, living your life, and doing that with other people. Got it. So that's how he defines Zen. And when when people say, oh, they're living their dharma, there's meaning, it, are, is, is it, does, my association when I hear that is that they're living their life's mission, they're living their lives, their soul's purpose, is that? Hard to tell, I don't know, maybe, yeah. Okay. It, it, you know, like these words are on cereal boxes now, so I'm never sure what, it, <laughs> exactly. what anyone means until I meet them and like, okay, yes. Here. So the, the, the Dharma talks are then the conversations around the teachings of Buddha. That's right. Okay. That's right. Got it. There are the talks. Yeah. And the Zen is the way of life. It, it, it Sort of uh, absorbing the teachings and exemplifying them in your daily actions, if you will. That's right. Very good. And the Zen arts are the actualization of that realization. So how one expresses, like if there's no self, then what's who's the self and self-expression? And what kind of expression happens when you can let go of the self? Mm. So, so that's at the heart of the Zen arts as well. So if you want to learn about the pine, you go to the pine, you know, as Basho right. said, you want to learn about bamboo, go to the bamboo, let the bamboo teach you. So right. that was, you want to learn about the water and the river, go to the river. Let the river teach you. Open up. Forget the self. Let the 10,000 things teach move you. you teach move you. you. That's the Dharma that I'm speaking of. Beautiful. And the Dharma is not just Buddhism. The Dharma right. is the truth, the law. So whenever it's, more of in an, any... it, it's like an experiential thing, a phenomenological moment, right? Yes. Perhaps. So it's not, it's not contained in buddhism you know Got i don't it. care about buddhism really it's just it's just anything that's real and true is dharma nice. that's in accord in harmony with the laws of the universe how things are how, how things, things truly are, are. so Beautiful. you know i practice buddhism but in the end that has to go <laughs> it all has yeah. to go yeah, well said. Well said. I mean, they're just means to an end. They're not end themselves, right? Yeah. And that's why I love the Buddhist teachings because it's so open in such a way. And, and Hojin, um, when you come back from this 10 day retreat into the wilderness, yeah, that was your exploratory phase, testing things out. Let's yes. See how this who, feels. Who are these people? Right. What are the, what are the, how do you know, like you to to commit yourself to a somebody's leadership, right. like so? You want to see the people around them, how they act. You want to see who's not there, who's not included in right. this adventure, who's not in the meditation hall. What what what's missing? That's imp just as imp was just as For important sure. to me. Um, so I they passed the test for me. I was like, yeah, this is a people I would want to be with and travel with on a journey for sure. Got and it. we really got tested. So I appreciated the rain and the conditions to really, you know, wasn't la a la la trip. It right. was hard. Right. It was hard. It was really a tough trip. And he pushed imagine. and he watched. So it wasn't, it was, he had a, feel the whole thing and you know how to work with individuals as well as a group and i i felt like it it was very um clear it was yeah. a very clear communication an intimate language a, an intimate transmission of of the teachings by by how he was 
he was. Yeah. And so that's when you decide to then join the monastery and officially go into the monastic life. Well, or? so then I thought, okay, so now I'm going to do a silent intensive. I wanted to see what it was like to sit intensively for a week in or 10 days in silence and do this. Sashin is a, um, is known in the Zen tradition as a, it means Sashin means to touch the heart mind to collect the heart mind. So it's a where a week where they we close the front gate. Everyone goes off of there wasn't computers or phones at that time, but you just soul the soul concentration is on the mind of Zazen and how it moves into work and eating and very simplified. So there's a schedule that everyone follows all together. We wake up at some hour that you probably would not want to wake up, like <laughs> three, three, three fifty to be seated oh, wow. by four twenty. And we wow. sit a couple periods in the morning. We have a formal meal called Orioki, and it's all in silence. Your eyes are lowered. And I thought, I don't know if I could do this because I'm I like um, to move a lot. Um, but the potter's wheel taught me how to quiet down and turn yeah. that movement and the grief and the troubles inward and release. So I was prepped for that in some way. So once I did that, uh, then I said, okay, I'm going to do a month. And I did a month. Wow. And okay, then that. Hold on. It's okay. just too much for my head. Uh, <laughs> okay. For those two weeks, I mean, for those 10 days. Were there moments of dis? I mean, I'm putting putting myself in that position. Were there moments of like anguish or desperation when you really needed and wanted to speak or like? Oh, in, in the, um, I wouldn't say no. I would say at that point, no. no I would. I was hungry for it. I. I really wanted to do it. Like my intention was so clear. And I was like so good following it all. Like I really kept my eyes lowered. I really like entered because I thought this is my life. Like I'm ready to make this big change. I can't be fooling around. I don't know why I knew that at that time, but I didn't yeah. fool your, around. Your spirit probably hasn't done this. This is not the first time your spirit is having this type of experience, I think. <laughs> yeah. Because you're so very well, well already Oh, oh, um, what's the word that I want to use? It's just like a natural fit for you, it seems. Yes, I was already like ripen, ripening in the process all along. So I, I, of course, I had to meet my mind. And that's the hardest thing. I mean, I, I was, I, I think I was buoy, buoyed at first just by the excitement of being in the retreat. And it was all okay. new. So you know how that is for you when you're a new thing. Sure. Like you're, the things that bother you sort of are a little in the shadows. Because So I was, um, and a little bit full, like I could sit really well. And I know I felt a little egoic on that, yeah. that I could sit a few periods at a time without moving. Um, and so that was there. And I, and so that was just seeing a lot. Um, and at that point, um, you know, my suffering wasn't so close, I have to say, that I didn't, I, I didn't feel it like some people I learned in retreat had had such horrific things happen in their yeah, life. Like these waves of emotion that erupt like a volcano yes. from within, right? Right. And theirs was like, you know, from very bad situations and abuses and traumas. Right. And I didn't really, I was pretty new. I didn't really know about that. Um, right. So I had a lot to, a lot to learn, um, a lot to wake up to. I, w I was waking up, but, it, and so after that, I knew I wanted to come back and I, and Okay, so should I go from there now? Yep. Yeah. So I signed up for a month 
and I, I did my month. And after that, I was allowed to discern. You always have to do a month first. We still do that because that takes you through a whole process. There's always right. a session in a month. So people can come into residencies for a month and they go through a process and end with session. So I did a, a month and then I applied for a year and I was accepted for a year in 1990. And then I, I never left. I stayed, I've been there since then. I think 1991, I moved in completely after I, you know, left school, the schools I was teaching and closed down what I was doing. I had a relationship too. We actually started together um, and I stayed and they left. Um, and um I was ordained in 95 and uh, the rest of the process continued and, and here I am. <laughs> and today you're also spending your time at the Fire Lotus Temple Zen Center in New York City, which is in Brooklyn, right. where I believe you also do these uh, weekly art practices with your students, right? Right. So, yes. Yeah, so after being at the monastery many years, we had bought, got, purchased this uh, place on State Street in Brooklyn mm -hmm. um, 22 years ago. And I've, I lived here before with another teacher. I was a helping monastic um, in residency for periods of time. And um, after COVID, um, I received the, um, uh, the privilege of, of coming down here to get the temple up and running again nice. and so i am, am developing it as um the zen center of new york city um the home of art practice and dharma practice and my, when my teacher was dying he said to me hoj don't let the arts die wow. and i and i said to him i will not that's beautiful yeah. Now this isn't just the Zen arts. It's I would just say it's the creative process. That's what I wanted to ask you, Hojin, because for somebody like me who has no experience with in the Zen world, but yeah. am an artist, a musician, right? Uh, how does someone like myself benefit from these sessions and this experience at the temple? Well, I mean, part of it is I am a Dharma teacher, so that's. The, you know, sitting, quieting down, um, looking at things deeply is part of the art practice, which artists already do. Like, um, let me see. Um, I love what the Christian mystic Evelyn Underhill says. Are you familiar with Evan, Evelyn Underhill? Evelyn Underhill, no, but I'm going to type her up here so we could Google her later. Look on mysticism. And I'll just paraphrase yeah. um, the mystic's way of seeing Evelyn Underhill. And she writes, I've changed it a little bit, but surrender yourself to be without selfish preoccupation. Clear your minds of prejudice. All that I ask is that we shall feel for a little time in a special and undivided manner the delights on this earth. It can be anything we please, a growing plant, running water, little living things, a tree. Look at these things willfully yet tranquilly. Refuse the messages that countless other aspects of the world are sending. And so concentrate your whole attention on this one act of loving. So to me, that's the the heart of the arts is to concentrate and give our whole attention to this one act of loving, no matter what we're picking up, a violin, yeah. um, a piece of clay, just you put your whole body and mind and into this one act um, completely, don't separate and just live it, you know? And that's not easy because everything... No comes up in between and then yeah. we have a practice. We Especially I believe for the struggling artist of the 21st century that it gets pulled in so many different directions with the necessities of our modern life 
to make a living and the perceptions of what's a success is supposed to look like versus, a unsa- you know, and I, I'm also speaking here for myself where I can't concentrate enough to actually sit down for many periods of time to compose. And I struggle with that, with my mm-hmm. attention deficit and all, and all these things. And something tells me that part of what you do and you teach people is not just the Zen way of life with sitting and, and practicing these meditative, contemplative uh, tools that allows us to be more centered, but they, you also, it helps to unleash, I guess, the inner artist in people too, right? Right. To, to just have presence and let, like, you don't need, I, I can, I do things on the way to my bed. I'll swipe a piece of paper with a mark just on my way to my bedroom. And then I'll wake up and, Oh, what, how did that get there? You know? So it, <laughs> so we don't have, it doesn't have to be this big deal. I try and take away the big dealness of creation because most of the art we see is like in a museum and we think and we start like that's what you have but no we're all unique so i if i picked up a violin i can do something on it it's not going to be of course maybe what you do in your training but i will be able to put my whole being into listening and forming something with it if i don't block it so mostly, I just try and open up that that spontaneity, that just um, just like to, to to even love those parts of us, those shadowy parts, and and see that that's also something we desire, uh, even though it's it's could be painful. Um, nice. um, that something in us is drawn to a certain feeling and to allow that to emerge. Got it. Beautiful. Um, And when does your group meet the art practice group? So we meet every, um, well, most Fridays uh, from 1030 to noon, except when I'm in session Mm -hmm. or, or there's something else. So we're about to finish this November and I'll start up a new cycle. It's in three month cycles. Mm -hmm. So I'll start, something new coming in December through, um, through um, uh, February, and then March will start another cycle. And you can bring, you're working it in your home studio, so you bring to it whatever medium you want to work in. It could be your voice, and I have people doing all kinds of things. And people can uh, read up more about it and even sign up on the website, right? That's right. Awesome. I think so you I- have that. Put it down here. Yeah. Yep, and I also put it on the description of the video on YouTube and on Spotify for people to look up later. ZMM.org is the website, the Zen Center of New York City, or Fire Lotus Temple as well in Brooklyn. Cool. Right. Well, I want us to wrap up our conversation around the fire, uh, Hojin, with an experiential moment. I would like it if you could lead us. Uh, based on everything that we spoke about art and art being at the center of our life, if there's something that you could guide us on a closing sort of meditation so that we can connect a little bit more inward. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to get out of my camera here and you take it away. Okay. So this is a time where you can just... Inhale and exhale. We need to do this and we can know that we're breathing. And as you inhale, breathe in new life. And as you exhale, just release. Until our last breath, we're always going to be letting go. So to take refuge, to unreservedly rest in that out breath and release, let go. And to know that you are the temple. You are the living temple we each are. 
And at any moment, we can go through the door and find stillness, spaciousness, and silence. And we go there through this precious breath. And just let the mind quiet down and connect. Let the breath lead. Just inhale and exhale. And you can do that throughout the day. When things are getting t intense, and in that way, we don't suppress, bypass. We can, but we can also face. We can learn to face whatever's arising, see it for what it is, let go, and take the next step. open ourselves up and be inspired by our great ancestors, by this great Mother Earth, the trees, the sky, the birds. And then bring that into what we need to take care of to be a benefit in this world. To relieve the suffering of ourselves and of others. I'll leave you with a chant that the Dalai Lama loved by Shanti Deva, a 12th, 10th century Tibetan teacher. For as long as space exists and sentient beings endure, may we too remain in this world to relieve the suffering of all beings. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Fred, so much. Thank you so much for this gift, Hojin, tonight around the fire with us on Spirit Reflections. I will not speak any words because I want to leave with this beautiful feeling you left us with. And I'd like to invite you all to come to our next episode around the fire. Hojin, big kiss. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care, Goodbye. Fred. Take, Take care, care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.